of their best numbers. Listeners tend to like one more than the other, and you've got to know which one. You've got to get the right one out of this marvellous morass of cardboard. <laughs> One of Peter Clayton's many jobs in broadcasting is to host a Radio 3 programme devoted to playing jazz requests. Every week, listeners write in asking to hear particular jazz recordings they hope are to be found in the BBC's vast record collection. Finding the specific recording means knowing how to use the catalogue. One and a quarter million cards, arranged alphabetically and cross-referenced under title, artist and composer. But just how complicated a process is it to find the card you want? There are three ways. You go to the title or the artist, or you don't get either from your listener, so you have to do some deduction. I've got a, I've got a letter here from a man who says he would like to hear a duet by Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines. Now, if all you know is that either Earl Hines or Louis Armstrong is on, you go to these artist cards. Now, OK, Louis Armstrong starts there. And they keep going, Armstrong, Armstrong. There's three and a half inches of solid cardboard there. Earl Hines about half of it. I happen to know that the duet he wants is called Weatherbird. So you go to the title cards, and that narrows it down a great deal and is a lot easier. But there are instances where the only way is to plod through all these cards. This collection of cards is a database. Of course, it's not on a computer, but you could actually program a computer to do the sort of job that Peter Clayton was doing by shuffling through these cards. Well, we've taken a small section of this database, about a thousand cards, it's about that many, and put them on this microcomputer. I'm going to do exactly the same work as he was doing by looking through the cards. First of all, I'm going to select the soloist. Soloist and Armstrong, A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N. N G. And there we have a 117 records with Louis Armstrong. This one is Ain't Misbehaving. And we can go along and look at some of the other ones, Squeeze Me, whatever that is, and I'm Not Rough, and so on and so forth. Now, I want one with Earl Hines on it, so I can select again, Soloist, and it's Hines, H-I-N-S. And there we've got 34 records with Earl Hines in it, and he's obviously in Squeeze Me with... Louis Armstrong. Now I know that weather was in the title, so I select once again on title weather. We don't need to type in the whole title. And there we have it, weather bird. One record of three, and we can look at another record, and we can see here the recording date, Chicago, 5th of December 1928. Well, you might ask why we'd want to put all this information on a computer in the first place. Well, it's very straightforward. If you wanted to access any of these cards, you actually have to be present here in this room. If the information was stored on a computer, you could access it from anywhere where there's a telephone line. Well, of course, there are a million of these cards here, and a little micro like this wouldn't make any dent on that whatsoever. But it can store, this particular system, 65,000 records, which is quite useful for many of the sort of databases you're likely to meet, particularly those in the home. So what do we need to know to use a database? Well, there are three fundamental concepts. Well, those three concepts have been around ever since computers were invented. And that's the concept of files, records and fields. And it's relatively easy to understand it when you can actually see them physically. Here in the gramophone library, this file is a file of one manufacturer and it's a collection of his records. So, exactly the same in computer terminology, a file is a collection of records. Here it's a real record, in computer terminology a record is a collection of items of information which are held in fields. In this case, one field with the record manufacturer, World Records. Another, the record number, SM424. The title, Hot Fives and Sevens Complete. Another field for the performer, Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines. And finally, a field for the track, track four, Weatherbird. Great music to drive to that. Well, in getting the information out of that database, we used a commercial data management program. Now, the handling of files of information in BASIC can be quite tricky, and the code to do it is different on different machines. So how is it possible to write a program to store information and then get hold of it in any way that I want? Well, I can demonstrate some of the principles by writing a simple program to store a list of people's birthdays. In BASIC, first we've got to decide on how many birthdays and how many names we might want to store. It's a bit like going to a shop and buying a birthday book. 
you've obviously got to choose a book that's about the right size for the number of entries you expect to make. Now, each entry here is a record. Here's David, and that's the first field, and the 3rd of November is his birthday. And each one of these is a record, and each contains two items of information, or two fields, the name and the birthday. Well, to do this on the computer, we use the concept of an array. And it sounds very complex, it's rather a difficult word, but an array is just a set of variables, in other words, stores, all with the same name, but labelled 1 to 10, 1 to 50, or 1 to 200, or whatever, depending on the maximum number of names or birthdays that we want to store. It's a bit like creating a series of boxes. The first one is called name string 1, the second name string 2, the third name string 3, and so on, up to 50. Now, let's have a look at this programme. We've got to tell the computer to expect a maximum of so many names. And here's the statement that does it. Dim means dimension, and it's telling the computer to expect up to 50 names. And the second line of our programme, line 20, again it's dimension, and it tells the computer to expect up to 50 birthdays. Well, the next thing is putting in the information. With the book, I simply find the next blank page or blank part of a page, and then I'll write a record in here with two fields and record in here another name and another birthday. And I do this as many times as I've got names. Well, on the computer, we're going to use a couple of commands, data and read. They're always linked together. And for the moment, we're going to put in just ten records. That's just ten names and birthdays to fill up part of an array with them. If some of the array is empty, it really doesn't matter. So. The next instruction we have here is line 30 and line 50, so we're going to read those 10 items of data with that for item 1 to 10, next item. And here are the two statements, read and data. Read on line 40 and data is listed on line 60. We're going to read for the first time through the loop, read name string 1 and date string 1, and that goes to the data list there, and it will read in David and call it name string one, and the 3rd of November and call it date string one. The next time around the loop, it will read name string two, which will be John, the contents will be John, and date string two, which will be the 6th of August, and so on and so on. And it'll go around that loop until it's read in the whole of that data and set up the array. So when we run the program itself, the data will be set into the array. Well, how do we find the information when we need it? Well, between lines 70 and 140, we've got a repeat until, which means it's a loop. And on line 80, we're going to input, and then in between the quotation marks there, we've given a prompt. Enter name and date, so we enter either the name or the date, and we're going to call it a variable name, query string. And we'll, it will go round and round the loop, and on line 140, until query string equals stop. In other words, when we type stop into the program, it will actually stop. Line 130 print just actually gives us an empty line to make reading it easier. Well, we're going through 10 items of data, so we have another loop here between 90, line 90 and 120. For item equals 1 to 10, next item, it will go through the data 10 times. And these are the two instructions which carry out the logic. The first time around the loop, if name string 1 equals query string, then print date string 1. And on line 110, if we'd entered a date, if date string 1 equals query string, then print name string 1. And it will go round and round this loop for item equals 1 up to 10, 10 times, until we've read through all the data that we've actually put into it. So, let's run it. There is the prompt, enter name or date. So, I'm going to enter David. And I've got a birthday there, the 3rd of November. This time I'm going to enter the actual date, 3rd of November. And it scanned through and found two names there, David and Carol. And I'm going to say stop. Well, there are two major disadvantages with the program. Let's just have a look at it again. I'm just going to list the first half dozen lines or so, so we can see it. Well, first of all, if we want to add more dates or names, we have to alter the program itself. We can see here, this uh, instruction here, this loop, only allows us to read ten items of information. So if we add to it, we'd obviously have to change that number. The information itself in this data string is embedded here within the program itself. And that would cause all sorts of problems. In fact, you'd have to be a programmer, virtually, to be able to change it. The second disadvantage is that the amount of data you can handle is limited by the size of memory in your machine that's left over after your program's been loaded. 
So normally, we simply wouldn't write the program in that way. We'd write it so that the data can be kept in files quite separate from the program itself. And we'd have to be able to store those files on disk or on tape, because otherwise we'd lose the information when the mas machine switched off. In BASIC, we'd have to write instructions for the machine which were rather like what we'd do with a real file. We'd take a file and then we'd name it. We'd call the file, let's say, birth. The second action would be to open the file and then we'd copy into the file from the memory of the computer and so on and store it in there. And finally, we would then close the file. So, in basic, the words of code you'd write would reflect those four actions. Similarly, if you wanted to get the information out of the file, you'd write code which would be like the reverse of that. You'd look for a file called birth, you'd open the file, copy the information into the computer's memory and then close it. And once the information was in the memory, you could search through it in the way that we saw earlier. Well, if I wanted to use a database, I wouldn't want to struggle through the complexities of writing it, especially in BASIC. I'd be much more likely to buy a package to do a serious job. Now, here's an interesting problem. There are over two million video recorders in this country, and it's a real problem keeping track on what you've recorded, particularly if you've got a lot of cassette tapes and you want to find something quickly or find a space for a new recording. This might be the sort of thing a school might want to do where they've got a whole library of tapes. Now, we've got a small database package here loaded on this machine, and it really is quite fun to use. When you buy a package like this, it tells you exactly what you've got to do and makes life very easy for you. Here we've got a list of alternatives that we can do at this point. It's called a menu and this is a menu-driven system. So I want to load an existing data file, I hit 1 and it says insert data file disk and press a key. So I take a new disk and load it in, and that's the one with my file on it, and hit a key. And immediately it comes up with the two data files that I've got on this disk. One of plants and the other one called videos. Well, that's the one I want too, so I hit that one. And there it is, data file videos. It contains 83 records and there's room for approximately 68 more. So there I've got 83 recordings detailed on that file. I can add a record, delete a record, search a record and so on. So let's hit three and search for a record. I don't know what tape number it is or the count or the title or the subtitle. And I'm going to use artist, what a name. And all I tap in there is the question mark Mac. And what this will do is to search out the record, search through the records to find where the artist, the field artist, contains the letters M-A-C. I don't mind about the duration or the subject or the priority. And there it is. And the first one is on tape one. And it's strings and things making most of the micro. Business club, Mac and others. Computer program, my goodness, I did do a lot of recordings of myself. But there is one that isn't me, but it's obviously found the letters M-A-C in the name of John Mace under artist. Right, what else can I do? Let's go back to the menu once again. Well, perhaps this time I want to make a recording, say a 25-minute recording. So I want to search through my files to find space for a 25-minute recording. And that's where these greater than, less than signs come in. I'm going to search again, hit number three for a record. I don't know what the tape number is, the count of the title, subtitle, artist, and it's going to search on duration. And I'm going to search for something which, for a space which is greater than 24 minutes and less than 30 minutes, 30 minutes, let's put it 30 minutes. I don't mind about the subject. The priority, since I'm going to record in this area, I want something that I'm not, I don't want to keep, so I'm going to give it a low priority, say zero. And press the space bar and it comes immediately with one with me on it Mac and others business club that's on tape number one count of 570 there's one on tape number four it's mash great program and that's about all of 25 minutes well it's obvious which one I'm going to over record it's hard enough remembering to write the name of a recording on a cassette itself let alone putting it into the computer so whether you'd actually use this program or not is another matter you would need to be very disciplined in the way you put the information in You've got to remember to change the entries if you record over something. You've got to remember the, the tape counter to zero and so on. Now, just as before, this program can only hold as much information as you can get into what's left of the computer memory after the program's loaded. This limits the size of the data file. Going back to our gramophone records, that's about enough to hold the details of 100 to 140 gramophone records, which isn't bad for a small personal collection. But suppose you wanted to keep more information. The next step would be to arrange for the program to be able to pull in information in chunks from a bigger data file. And using this technique, you'll be limited only by the size of the computer backing store. 
the floppy disk or a cassette. But when we start handling a lot of data and want to search through it quickly, tape is pretty useless. Not only is it slow, but it only enables us to get at the information held on it in a stream. And we can only read it sequentially, bit by bit, along its length. One advantage of a disk is that it enables you to access the information in what's known as random access. And you can get at any information by moving the read heads across like this to any of the tracks and very rapidly you can select the information that you want to get hold of. This means we can actually break up our file so that we go very, very quickly to any part of it we'd like. Let me show the difference with our birthday book. If I were going through my book, I'd have to go through sequentially, looking at every name in turn, one after the other, or every birth date. It's very slow, and it's rather like using tape. Much more likely, I wouldn't use that at all, I'd buy a book with an index in it. So if I wanted to find David's birthday, I'd go straight to the D, open the page, and there is David, the 3rd of November. And it's a thing you can do on the disc that you can't really do on tape. So for serious, real users, discs are essential. A five-inch disc of this sort, this sort of floppy, would hold the details of about 400 of our gramophone records. And there are bigger floppy disks. This one is an eight-inch disc, which can hold details of about 5,000 records. But floppy disks really do have their disadvantages for serious applications. That's the recording surface, and it's very easy to touch it, get finger marks or dirt into it. And so it's very important to keep backup copies. The other disadvantage, of course, floppy disks actually wear out. But databases on micros are being used increasingly for serious, if rather limited, purposes in the real world. And our researcher, Catherine Robbins, has been to see one rather unusual application. Every time you take a holiday on a British waterway, you're likely to be asked to fill in a form to say where you're going or where you've been. Holiday traffic is on the increase, but the canal authorities are short of money, so management of the system needs to be efficient. At the British Waterways headquarters in Rickmansworth, information from each form is entered into a database which already contains 20 years' worth of information on boat movements. This touch-sensitive pad is used to enter details of your journey. The 5 million bytes' worth of data can be handled by an ordinary micro, but because there's so much of it, a floppy disk just couldn't cope. So they use what's known as a Winchester or hard disk. But why do they want all this information? Well, one reason is that if somebody wants to open a marina like this one at Karos near Tring, the Waterways Board will only grant a license if it's convinced that there's enough water available, not only here, but also in the rest of the system, to cope with all the extra boats. Now, while it might not look as if it would present much of a problem if a new marina was built around here, say, it could present a bit of a problem down here. As people take their boats, down the canal, lock by lock, water is lost through each of the locks in turn. Of course, canals were originally built to link rivers, and many of them pass over the tops of hills. So all this lost water has to be replaced. It has to be found from somewhere and then pumped up into the system, which all in all is a pretty costly business. Now, some parts of the system are short of water, there's no water problem at Kauros, for instance, but elsewhere there might well be. The statistical relationship between the likely number of boats passing along the canal and the level of water present is something that this database can predict and map out. This would be particularly important if a marina like the one at Kauros were to be expanded. If you have um, 20 new, new boats at, at Kauros, um, and they're out for pretty well, say, 25 weeks in the, in the, in the, during the summer, and that means a maximum of about 500 trips which will be taken in total from cow roast. And we can see that there's absolutely no problem at most of these sites. The only problem comes at Napton and Claydon on the South Oxford Canal where we do have problems with water supply and they don't really want to see any increased um, usage there at all. So negative water figures could mean empty locks or canals. But with the help of the database, problems can be anticipated and the whole system can be run more evenly and therefore more economically. Well, Catherine mentioned using a Winchester or a hard disk, and this is the sort of unit she's referring to. The main difference between this and a floppy is that it's a completely sealed unit that enables the data to be packed much more densely on the recording surfaces. But, of course, it can't be interchanged. This particular unit is eight inches across the disk, but it holds eight million characters of information. 
If we wanted to hold more information, we'd have to go to a large-scale mainframe computer. And this interchangeable disk here would hold 200 million characters of information. But it is interchangeable, just like a floppy is. If we use the same technology as the Winchester disk, then we could push this story from one disk unit up to 1,200 million characters, which is probably more than enough to hold all the details of the gramophone records in the BBC Record Library. Well, we can still use our micro for getting at information on large databases. And we've got a setup here which is quite interesting. We've got our micro, we've got a monitor, we've got a printer just in case we want to print out some results. And we've hooked it up to the telephone using this piece of equipment. It's an acoustic coupler. And there's a program running in the machine which enables us to send code through the acoustic coupler to an ordinary telephone into the telephone network. And we've dialed up a number which gives us access to the data held on a large mainframe computer owned by the New York Times. And there are 1,800 million characters of press cuttings in that database. We've only made a local call, but we can get into that. And let's see what it is. Well, we're already signed on to it. And here are all the details of our signing on. It's copyright of the New York Times. And I thought it might be interesting to find out what's going on in the United States on computers and education in television. Well, first of all, let's find out what references they have to their three networks. And we're ready for this, and I, can talk, I know that the three networks are CBS, or ABC, or NBC. And I touch that, it's now scanning 1,800 million characters, and it will find out how many references there are to CBS, or ABC, or NBC in those files. And there it is, the result, 9,006 references. Right, well, let's reduce that. And to reduce it, all I type is 1, and that's the previous phrase, CBS or ABC or NBC, and education. And there's a the result. There are 112 references to education in the three major networks. So our final query will be 2 and computers. Of course, the response you're going to get will be very dependent on how many people are on the system at any one time. And there's just one reference to computers and education on their three major networks, so it doesn't look as if they're doing an awful lot about it. So let's find out what that's got to say, and we can do that by simply typing display. If I wanted, I could type it out on the printer to look at later. But I'll just take it up on the screen. Well, it's an extract from the Los Angeles Times from the 1st of October 1982, so it's fairly recent. CBS Inc. has formed a new unit, CBS Software, to handle game, education and home management software for the home computers. Say so CBS intends to become leader in advanced technology businesses. And there are numerous other references there. So CBS looks as if they are beginning to do something about it. Now, valuable piece of information. Well, using this kind of commercial database can be costly at the moment because of subscription charges. But many people believe that this is the way we'll get information in the future. Next time, we'll be looking critically at the use of micros in the small business. Until then, goodbye.